All right, I think we're good. Uh, hi, everybody. I'm Adam Robin. I'm a developer at GitHub, as Steve said. Um, and I want to tell you today three stories about working remotely and some of the things that I've learned about how to work remotely without becoming a sad, angry, and lonely person. <laughs> so the first story is about Apple. Uh, Apple is an interesting company for a lot of reasons, but I want to just talk about one of them today, and it's this. I think that in Apple's ideal world, everyone who works for Apple, who works on inventing and creating their products, would live and work in Cupertino, California. And not only that, they would all work on one campus, and not only that, they would all work in one building. Now that sounds a little crazy, but if you don't believe me, look at this artist's rendition of the new campus that Apple is building in Cupertino. Apple has about 14,000 US employees, not counting retail and support. Uh, this one building is designed to hold 12,000 people, and another 2,200 people are gonna fit in a couple of other buildings right next door to it. So that means that Apple's entire US-based creative workforce will fit on this campus, and 86% of them are gonna fit in this one building. And if the numbers aren't enough to convince you, just look at the light rays of God shining down from above. <laughs> I think they think this is a pretty good idea. <laughs> so you might look at this and think, why? Uh, it's reported that this is going to cost $5 billion to construct, and Apple does have $150 billion in cash sitting around, but $5 billion is still no small change. So why go to all this trouble building this big white spaceship? Well, in Apple's words, the point of it is to promote shared creativity and collaboration and spur invention of the next several generations of Apple products. This is uh, from the documents that they provided to the city of Cupertino explaining why they want to do this. This is really what Apple sees as a big part of their secret sauce. Let's get everyone together all in one place and watch the magic happen. We'll have the hardware people, the software people, sales, design, marketing, business people, all working in the same place. They'll all have to hold the door for each other on their way into the office. They'll all eat together in the cafe. They'll all bump into each other in the on-campus Apple store. And when you have all these different people from different parts of the company running into each other and bumping into each other all the time, great ideas will come out of it. Now, this isn't the first time that Steve Jobs has had this idea. Uh, since his death in 2011, there have been a lot of articles and books written about him, and many of them have mentioned the atrium on Pixar's campus in Emeryville, California. Now the design of this uh, atrium, which is very centrally located within the main building on the campus, is for it to be a place where people from different parts of the company would run into each other. And in fact, uh, the story is that the original version of the plans for this building said that uh, Steve Jobs dictated that the only bathrooms in the building would have been off of this atrium. And so everyone would have had to go there every day, I guess having great ideas while their bladders are full. <laughs> But the, the goal of this, of this big atrium and of the big white spaceship, is to increase communication within the company and especially to encourage cross-fertilization of ideas. The point is just to get people talking. And it works really well. I got to witness this firsthand when in 2006 I graduated from college and moved from the East Coast out to Cupertino to start working for Apple. I was hired by the Safari team. Safari, if you don't know, is the web browser that comes installed on every Mac and every iPhone and iPad. <laughs> Uh, at that time, the team was about 20 to 25 people, and we were all working in this one area of one of the buildings on Apple's Infinite Loop campus. We all had offices uh, in this one area, and they all opened up onto a shared couches and coffee table area. That's me on the left looking a little baby-faced. Now, some people preferred working in their offices, and some people preferred even doing it with their doors closed so that they could really concentrate. But a lot of people, like myself, liked working out on the couches. It gave you really easy access to everyone and spurred a lot of great conversations. Uh, and, you know, we even had access to all the managers and the director of the department there. Everybody's offices were just within a few hundred feet of each other. And in fact, there was uh, some construction going on when I joined the team uh, to expand our area, but it meant that in the meantime, a lot of us were even sharing offices. So even if you were back in your office, you might be in a shared space with someone else. Now, of course, there were uh, some problems that this caused. You know, like many workplaces, it was kind of distracting. There were a lot of conversations going on. Uh, and you had uh, meetings to attend to assign uh, bugs, and you had uh, meetings for designing new features and meetings with other teams. And there were also a lot of people asking each other for help, which could really interrupt you if you were right in the middle of uh, you know, getting your mind really wrapped around some problem. Someone comes by and asks you for help. Uh, it can really pull you out of the zone. But despite those distractions, it was a very productive environment. 
Uh, and for me as a new person on the team, it was immensely helpful to have all of the experts about Safari and WebKit uh, right in one area with me. I could ask anyone a question if I, if I needed to learn something. And also all the conversations that were going on around me, especially when I was new, I often didn't feel really qualified to contribute to the conversation because I was still just learning my way around. But I could learn a lot from listening in on those conversations, even though I wasn't contributing myself. And we also, you know, being an infinite loop there, it's not quite the big white spaceship, but we did have all these other teams at Apple all around us. We had access to people who work on lower levels of the OS and people who work on mail and, and all these things that interact with Safari. Uh, and so we were able to, to talk to all these people uh, very quickly and very easily. So it was a very productive work environment. Uh, and so, of course, you know, the obvious thing for me to do was to move away. Uh, in uh, 2007, my then girlfriend, now wife, was in her second year of a PhD program at Penn State out there in State College, Pennsylvania. And if you've ever gotten a PhD yourself or seen one up close and in person, you know they take a long time. So uh, since this seemed like this was going to be a long-term relationship, I moved from Menlo Park out to State College. Uh, I kept my same job working for the Safari team, but I started working remotely. Now, Steve Jobs was known for saying that uh, it's in Apple's DNA that technology is not enough, that it's technology married with liberal arts that really makes things work at Apple. So that's what he thought Apple's DNA was. Uh, working remotely, it turns out, is not really in Apple's DNA. Uh, as I said before, they really want everyone to be out there in Cupertino. And there's no company policy about people working remotely. Every time it happens, it's made on a, the decisions are made on a case-by-case -case basis. And the company's really not all that well set up for it. And so the end result is not that many people work remotely. So by the time I left the Safari team in 2012, uh, we had grown to about six, a uh, little over 60 people. And almost everybody was out there in California. And then I was in Pennsylvania. We had one guy in Texas and one guy in Helsinki, Finland. So we were this very small percentage of the team working remotely. And uh, as you might expect, you know, it sometimes felt a little isolating and left out. But I think that we were actually a uh, surprisingly high percentage of the team working remotely compared to other teams at Apple. Uh, we, uh, I, I think the Safari team was actually uniquely well suited for remote work and that's because another uh, piece of software that fell under the Safari team's purview is WebKit. Now for the developers out there you probably know of WebKit as its own thing but the way that most people uh, interact with WebKit is through their web browser. They're not really thinking of WebKit itself. Uh, but WebKit forms the core of a number of web browsers, including Safari and Chrome, although Chrome has their own version of WebKit now that they're calling Blink. Uh, but if you're using the internet on your phone, you're almost certainly using WebKit inside that browser. And WebKit is an open source project, and so that means that there are people outside of Apple who are also contributing to WebKit. And so the Safari team, while we had all this great communication going on inside Apple's campus physically, we also were interacting with people outside of the company all the time. We would do this through uh, IRC. This, was the, this is the public WebKit chat room, but we had a similar private Safari chat room that only Safari engineers uh, could get access to. We have a public Bugzilla bug tracker. We would do all of our code reviews electronically. And so all of these electronic processes that we had in place and were using every day for WebKit translated over to Safari as well. So it meant that working remotely for the Safari team was actually a pretty okay experience, even though there weren't that many people doing it. Because of all this electronic communication going on, we were able to keep in touch with the team. There was a lot of email going around, a lot of code reviews happening through email, a lot of chatting in IRC. But of course, we were still missing out. We weren't there in Cupertino for all those great in-person conversations that were going on that were deciding the way that new features were going to work and that uh, were deciding new architecture, you know, the architectural decisions for how we were going to structure the code. We, uh, you know, I was still calling into meetings, uh, but if you've ever been the one person on the speakerphone in a meeting, you know it's not very fun. It's very hard to get a word in. No one knows when you're trying to say something, and you just have to kind of talk over people. And of course, it made it also harder for me to ask questions of people. I wasn't constantly physically surrounded by all the experts there. But on the other hand, it completely got rid of all those distractions that I was talking about. I suddenly didn't have other conversations going around me all the time that I had to try to tune out. I didn't have people coming by to knock on my office door to ask me questions while I was right in the middle of something. I could really focus on the work that I wanted to do and really get a lot done. I felt very productive working this way. Now, of course, it also meant that there was a little higher barrier to entry for other people asking me questions, but even that actually turned out to be a benefit in some ways, because sometimes the questions that people had, they would realize before they had typed the whole thing out that they actually knew the answer to it, and so they didn't have to interrupt me. 
Or if they you know, really did need to talk to me, they would explain it in this very clear, concise way, typed out instead of kind of rambling through an explanation of it. And so we could often come to a, a very clear answer to that question very quickly, better than we could in person. So while I was working remotely, uh, I actually learned that it was very important for me to be making visits back to Cupertino, partly because this is just how Apple works. Having people there on campus is, imp is important. I could be part of these conversations that were happening in person. I could be physically present in the meetings that I was attending and so wouldn't have to be just shouting over people over on the phone. And it was a, also a good time to be more visible to my management chain. But actually, I think one of the most important things about these visits back to Cupertino was that it just gave me a chance to hang out with people. These were you know, the people I had made friends with working at Apple. When we were all sitting around the couches area, you, know, you get a group of people in a room all day and they're doing work, but if you talk enough, your conversation's going to stray onto topics that aren't about work. You're going to talk about what your commute was like and what you did this weekend and when your parents are coming to visit and all sorts of things like that, and you develop friendships. And so these visits back were actually one of the most important things about them for me was that it gave me a chance to uh, reconnect with these people, to, to bring these friendships up to date. And it's something that's very hard to do electronically. You know, people would type these questions to me and I would give them a very concise answer back and in none of that do you get this, you know, kind of incidental conversation about how someone's feeling that day or anything like that. So being there in person really let me reconnect with these people and I think that that actually then led me to work better with them too because now, you know, you've had this experience where you have a friend that you've been keeping up with over email and you haven't seen them in a long time and maybe, the, you know, over time the communication just starts to kind of piddle out and get a little strained. And then you see them in person at a wedding or a reunion or a conference and suddenly it's like all that time is just melted away and you're back where you were and you're able to connect with them again. And so that would happen with my coworkers. It would then make the electronic communication that we would have when I was back home so much easier and more fulfilling. Now, this could just be a nice thing that I'm telling myself to justify hanging out and playing rock band with my friends in California, but there's actually some pretty interesting research out there that bears this out. Uh, there's uh, a couple of people, Bonnie Nardi at UC Irvine and Steve Whitaker at UC Santa Cruz, have come up with this interesting theory of communication zones, which they say are a social field within which effective communication uh, is allowed to take place. And these zones require social bonds to even form in the first place, and they also require this thing called attentional contracts, which is basically someone uh, allowing you to command their attention for a little uh, bit of time so that you can actually talk with them. And they say that these communication zones degrade, degrade over time, but they get replenished with in-person contact. Uh, another interesting researcher is James Coleman, who's a sociologist at the University of Chicago, who's come up with this concept of social capital which uh, is basically a measure of the strength of, a, of relationships in a group of people and the way that those relationships allow the group to function. And it's another resource just like physical capital or human capital. Now, that's a lot of big words and a lot of names and a lot of research, uh, but I think it's always nice to have science tell you that you should go visit your friends in California from time to time. So that's the first story about Apple. Uh, the second story is about WebKit. Now I mentioned WebKit earlier and explained that it's the core of the Safari browser and of uh, many other browsers and it's on your phone and it's an open source project. But the thing that's a little bit different about uh, WebKit compared to kind of the platonic ideal of an open source project where you have developers who are working on the project in their spare time just for the love of the code, for, you know, it's solving problems that they need to solve, they love the technical challenge and working with each other. With WebKit, almost all of the developers who are the major contributors to the project are working for companies. They're working for companies that use WebKit in their products. Companies like Apple and Google and Nokia and Blackberry who all have browsers that use WebKit. Uh, companies like Adobe that ha Adobe has this Adobe Air platform that is a web-based cross-platform application toolkit. And so these are the, the companies that make up the majority of the contributions to WebKit. Uh, there are volunteer contributors to WebKit, but they almost very quickly get scooped up by any one of these companies. And so if any of you out there are looking for a job, you should start contributing to WebKit and you will find jobs knocking at your door. So each of these companies has uh, teams of people who are employed to work on WebKit full or part time as part of their actual work for that company. So it's not volunteer. And these teams are all communicating within each other. Like I said, at Apple, we had that you know, Safari area inside Infinite Loop with the couches and everything, and that was how we communicated. Teams at Google and Nokia and Blackberry each have their own systems for communicating with each other. Well, the communication between the teams was all happening through the WebKit project and through these electronic means of communication that I mentioned, the IRC room and the Bugzilla bug tracker and our mailing lists. 
And so what, what you would find is that over time, when all the communication is purely electronic, there's a lot of opportunity for misperception, miscommunication. It's easy to read a sentence that someone writes and it comes across as being very blunt, even when they didn't quite mean it to be that way. Or consequently, it's uh, easy, if you are the person writing the sentence, it's often much easier to just write something in the simple, straightforward way and not try to couch it in all these nice words to make people you know, not feel too bad. And you're missing all the visual and uh, emotional cues that you get when you're talking to someone in person. You can't hear the tone of their voice. You can't see the facial expression that they're making. You can't have eye contact with them. And a great way that I saw to describe this recently was on the internet, nobody can hear you being subtle. I think this is really true. You, you know, you would end up with these long email threads of people on the WebKit project who are, you know, digging in on these little minute issues and basically you end up with people talking past each other. And as these mis little miscommunications and misperceptions, none of it's outright malice, it's just misinterpreting someone's attitude, misinterpreting the way that they're phrasing something. But over time, these things build up and it's easy to forget that you're actually talking to a person. It's not just an email address or a username or an avatar. And so we were seeing this happen in the WebKit project more and more uh, over the time that I was at Apple. A lot of these companies started contributing to WebKit for the first time and in big ways. And so suddenly it was less Apple plus a few volunteers and now it was all these big companies trying to interact. And so we saw these little miscommunications and misperceptions building up over time and we wanted to do something about it. And so the thing that we decided to try was to have this thing called the WebKit Contributors Meeting which was just a chance for anyone who works on WebKit, whether you're employed to do it or not, to come together and just talk. And so this is a picture of the very first one that we had in 2010 uh, on Apple's campus at Infinite Loop there. And then it actually became an annual thing. Uh, we had it again in 2011 and 2012 and 2013. And so the main activity of these conferences, or of these uh, contributors meetings, was to talk about the big issues going on in WebKit, things that are kind of hard to talk about through email, explaining big new architectural decisions that are being made, talking about the best way to implement new web APIs, uh, talking about issues that affect the whole project, uh, like what build system are we going to use to build on all these different platforms, and how do we keep our tests running and green all the, all the time. It was also a great opportunity for people who were kind of new to the project to, to get some time with people who had been around longer uh, and maybe advocate for uh, you know, a patch that you'd put up that you need reviewed that someone hadn't looked at in a while or get some advice on the best way to implement something. But I think one of the most valuable functions that it would serve was just letting people reconnect. You would talk to the person that you had had that long email thread with over the last few months and that you had been arguing and arguing back and forth on. And you would realize that you know, we're both trying to make WebKit better, we're trying to make WebKit succeed, we might have slightly different ideas about how to do it, but we have a shared goal. And even more than that, we're both people. You know, you laugh when, you're, when you think something's funny, you frown when you think something's sad. It sounds simple, but you don't get any of that interaction when you're just communicating electronically. And suddenly you get all these people in the same room with each other and you realize we're all just living, breathing people and we can, we can get along. And I would find that after each one of these meetings, the mood in the project would lift considerably and it felt like suddenly everyone was being much more productive and congenial. So that's the second story about WebKit. The third story is about GitHub. So uh, about a year and a half ago, I left Apple and came to GitHub. And there are a lot of things that are different between uh, Apple and GitHub. GitHub is a much smaller company. It's a much younger company. It's a company that's very focused on developers where Apple is more of a consumer products company. But I think one of the biggest differences for me uh, coming to GitHub was how distributed it is. Uh, now GitHub has a headquarters in San Francisco and that is where uh, the biggest concentration of people working for GitHub live. But if you zoom out a bit, you see that we're actually quite distributed throughout the US and throughout the world. Uh, in fact, uh, we only have uh, less than a quarter of people working for GitHub actually live in and around San Francisco. And even the people who are there uh, aren't necessarily coming into the office every day. And I, I know it looks a little lonely down there in Australia, but there are actually three people all in Melbourne that all just collapse into one pin there. So even down there in Australia, we have a pretty good showing. Now this isn't something that has happened accidentally. GitHub has been very intentional about being so distributed. And we see a lot of benefits that come out of it. Um, now, some of them are specific to the kind of product that GitHub is building. GitHub.com is a tool to let people work together who aren't necessarily in the same place. And so by having 
the people building github.com not being in the same place, we have to use it the way that we are hoping other people will use it. It helps us dog food our product, come up with ideas for how to make it better. We can see when things aren't working because they aren't working for us, and then we can assume they aren't going to work for other people. But that's very specific to just the one product that we are producing. I think there are a lot of other benefits that we get that we think would apply to any company. For instance, by being so distributed, it forces most of our communication to be electronic, and that means that most of it is archived and searchable. And uh, Ryan Tomeko talked about this a little bit at his talk here last year about having all of our communication be electronic and available with a URL and having it be lock-free. Uh, and all these benefits uh, come out of being distributed. When you're a new person joining GitHub, if you want to find out, if you have an idea for a new project, you can look and see, did anybody talk about this in the past? Maybe this came up a couple of years ago and a lot of the different issues got discussed. And so you can start that conversation without rehashing everything that's gone before. You can refer back to the old conversation because it's all archived. It also lets us uh, focus much better on tasks. As I mentioned with moving uh, east from Apple, I was suddenly able to concentrate much better. And that's basically our default state for everything going on at GitHub. Everyone's very able to concentrate on the work that they're doing and interact when they choose. You know, come into a chat room when you need to take a break from the code that you're writing, check your email, respond to people, help other people out. But the default is this very intense focus on what you're doing. It also lets us uh, work whenever we want, whenever you feel most uh, creative, most productive. There was actually a YouTube video that we put up on our GitHub uh, YouTube channel just a couple of days ago. Uh, talking to one of the animators who works for GitHub, uh, making animations for promotional videos and educational videos. And he was talking about his experience with having a, his son was born two weeks early and so he suddenly had to stop working and go you know, deal with his son. But, but with the way that GitHub is set up with everybody in different time zones, everybody working, uh, not just trying to be nine to five Pacific time, but working whenever is most productive for them, it was much easier for him to take the time off maybe fit in a little bit of work here and there if he wanted to, but he certainly was not under any pressure to. So I, I would recommend watching that video if you get a chance. I think it also gives us all much uh, gra a greater sense of autonomy in our jobs. I think whenever you work remotely, uh, and this was certainly my experience at Apple, you don't have someone looking over your shoulder physically or, or kind of virtually. You feel like you are able to make decisions more on your own and it gives you kind of greater satisfaction in your job. You're more in charge of your own destiny. Now we don't have a traditional management chain at, Apple, at uh, GitHub. Uh, we follow more of the open source model where people work on things that they find intrinsically interesting and you kind of recruit people to work on them with you, keeping in mind what's uh, important for the company as a whole. But even with a traditional management structure, you really gain a lot of autonomy and independence and there's been a lot of research out there showing that when people feel more independent in their job, they are, uh, have greater job satisfaction and are more likely to stick around. It also means that anyone that, who kind of has to be distributed, like maybe you need ops people in all these different time zones so you can keep your site up and running all throughout the day, or you need support people in different time zones to deal with support questions coming in. Those people are now first class instead of being second class. They're not the three people who happen to be you know, over in East Asia. They get to work with everyone in the company the way everybody else is working. And it also lets us hire anyone. We aren't limiting our applicant pool to just the people who are in San Francisco or can move there and afford to live there. We can now hire the best people in the world. And we're more attractive to those people because you get to spend more time with your friends and family instead of commuting. And this, this is a big deal for us. Uh, we have a lot of family at GitHub and it's something that's very important to people. Our CEO, Tom Preston Werner, describes this whole thing as the company being optimized for happiness. And working uh, remotely and in a dist distributed fashion is not the whole story there, but it, it is a big part of it. And he has a great blog post about it. If you just Google for Optimize for Happiness, uh, you'll find it. So we do get a, a lot of benefits out of working remotely, but it can be challenging. Um, and as an example of that, uh, just last fall, I joined a new team. And over the last year, we've grown now to about seven people. And the thing about this team is that everybody is working in a different place. I'm in Pennsylvania. We have someone in New York, in Virginia, in Georgia, uh, in New Orleans, in Colorado, and just one person out there in uh, GitHub headquarters in San Francisco. And so not only are no two of us uh, living in the same place, but none of us had ever worked together before. And so we were able to very quickly become productive. We had all been at GitHub for a little while and kind of knew how things work there. And so we were able to work together and get good things done, uh, despite having never worked together before or living in the same place. But we found that uh, 
even though we were getting work done, sometimes it felt a little bit harder than it should have been. And we were having a hard time making big decisions about the product. We could, you know, put up a pull request and get that code reviewed really well, but trying to decide what are the big features that should go into this uh, project, what's the timeline that we're all looking at here, those kind of big decisions were really challenging for us to make. And so I opened up an issue uh, on our repository suggesting that we all get together in San Francisco. Um, now we use issues for a lot of things at GitHub that aren't just code related and this is one example of them. But we also have whole repositories that are devoted to non-code things. We have a repository about legal issues. We have one that is a place just where people uh, coordinate group runs when you happen to be in the same city. We have ones about what events we should have at the office. So this was an issue that I opened up saying, why don't we all get together in San Francisco and talk some of this stuff out. And this is something that most teams at GitHub do once or twice a year. Uh, some of the bigger teams do it for a whole week and have big presentations about stuff going on on the team, but we're a pretty small and new team, so we said, let's just do three days. We'll use Monday and Friday just as travel days, and then we can kind of have two days of really hashing out all these big issues that we aren't really getting to solve electronically, and then one day just to hack together, because that's something that we never get to do since we all live in different places. And so we did this, and it was amazing. I mean, in those two days, we made more decisions than we had made in weeks trying to talk things out electronically. It was amazingly productive. But I think uh, at least as important, and maybe even more important, was that being there in San Francisco gave us time just to hang out and to get to know each other. We had never worked together before, and we were trying to learn how to work together. And so sometimes that meant that we were playing pool and DJing for each other after work, uh, sometimes it meant that we were going to a Giants game and eating kind of amazing, kind of horrible food. Uh, sometimes it was going to a restaurant, and it just gave us time to get to hang out, get to figure out who each person is, learn what their family life is like, learn what your interests are, and how we all fit together into a team. And it was really valuable, and I think it's not something that you can really do unless you're actually in person. Now, we do use video conferencing and Hangouts uh, more and more at GitHub these days, and particularly some of our bigger and more distributed teams use it. So this was a Hangout that our ops team was having a few weeks ago, or I guess now it's a few months ago. And these Hangouts are really useful for syncing up, for making sure everyone's on the same page, and for making sure no one is blocked. But it's not the same as being in person. A Hangout is not hanging out. I mean, you can't touch and uh, you know, shake someone's hand. You can't smell them. There's no shared environment for you to work in. And you also tend to stay on topic a lot more. Instead of uh, you know, wandering on to non-work things, you, you really focus on just work topics. And so you don't really get to know each other. Now we believe uh, you know, that this is not just something that teams should be doing, coming to San Francisco together. We do it at the whole company level. We have a thing called a summit that's basically a GitHub-only conference. And so we do a lot of conferencing, conference-y things there. We give big talks about goals for the company over the next year and financial issues and we talk about new products that we're working on and new APIs and we give updates on existing projects. Um, and we also try to get new people to, to the company to get up and kind of introduce themselves, let everyone know who they are and talk about things interesting to them that aren't work related. But there's also just a lot of time for hanging out. There's time just to sit around and talk. We throw a party where we DJ for us and our friends. We do things like learning how to arc weld and how to carve metal with oxyacetylene torches. And all these things, they are fun and that is part of the point of it, but it's also really important for work. We're a company made up of people who don't necessarily know each other from outside of work and we don't get to know each other until we get to come together. And so it builds a shared sense of a company, of a team, and lets us learn how to work together when we're apart. There was a great article uh, way back in 1995 in the Harvard Business Review written by Charles Handy from the London Business School, and I think this is a great quote from it. He said, paradoxically, the more virtual an organization becomes, the more its people need to meet in person. These meetings are the necessary lubricants of virtuality, which I think is a great phrase. And I, I think this is really true, and we have seen it to be true at GitHub. Meeting in person from time to time lets us work better together when we're apart. So that's the third story and last story uh, about GitHub. And I hope that if, you know, whether you're the only remote person on your team or you're working in an open source project or work in an entirely distributed company, you'll think about getting together face to face with the people you work with. Uh, now it's not going to make everything perfect, but I think it's a big part of making it work. It's amazing what a difference just a few days together can make. Connect with your teammates, get to know them, and you'll work better together. So thanks.